Hello. This is Earth Science of Riverside College Senior High School Department. Welcome to the course. We are now in Lesson 2 of Module 3 Energy Sources. For today's lesson, we will continue to describe how fossil fuels are formed. Also, we will understand how the heat from inside the Earth is tapped, as a source of geothermal energy for human use. Lastly, we will explain how hydroelectric energy is harnessed from flowing water. Matter that stores energy is called a fuel. Most of the energy we use today come from fossil fuels, or the stored solar energy. But fossil fuels have a disadvantage in that they are non-renewable on a human time scale, and cause other potentially harmful effects on the environment. Fossils are the preserved organic remains or traces of animals, plants and other organisms. These fuels include huge proportion of carbon and hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons, an organic compound consisting entirely of hydrogen and carbon. Examples are methane, ethane, propane, butane, and more. Fossil fuels are fuels formed by natural processes such as anaerobic decomposition of buried dead organisms. The age of the organisms and their resulting fossil fuels is typically million of years and sometimes exceeds 650 million years. Anaerobic digestion is the process by which organic matter such as animal or food waste is broken down to produce biogas and biofertilizer. This process happens in the absence of oxygen, in a sealed oxygen-free tank, called an anaerobic digester. The word anaerobic actually means in the absence of oxygen. Coal is a combustible black, or brownish black rock like material, occurring in rock strata in layers or veins, similar to what you can see here the picture. This is called coal beds, or coal seams. Coal is composed of carbon with small quantities of other elements hydrogen, silicon, oxygen, and nitrogen. Coal started forming over 350 million years ago through the transformation of organic plant matter. The harder forms, such as anthracite coal, can be regarded as metamorphic rock because of later exposure to elevated temperature and pressure. The formation of coal begins in areas of swampy wetlands where groundwater is near or slightly above the topsoil. Because of this, the flora present produces organic matter quickly, faster in fact than it can be decomposed. It is these layers of organic material that then form coal. The energy in coal initially comes from the sun, and is energy from sunlight trapped by dead plants. Coalification is the formation of coal from plant material, by the processes of diagenesis, and metamorphism. It also known as bituminization, or carbonification. Peat is dead vegetation with 60% carbon. It is an accumulation of plant or organic materials that only partially decompose due to exposure to water and carbon dioxide. It is also an evidence of plant remains in water. Lignite, often referred to as brown coal, is a soft, brown, combustible, sedimentary rock formed from naturally compressed peat. This lignite still has traces of plant remains, and it is considered the lowest rank of coal, due to its relatively low heat content. Bituminous, is the most abundant form of coal and a major source of heat energy. It contains 70-86% to 86 carbon and it forms when even more pressure is applied to lignite. In this stage, no trace of plant materials left. 
In the next succeeding videos, watch and understand how are the types of fossil fuels are formed. Coal. Coal is a black or dark brown combustible rock made primarily of carbon. It was formed millions of years ago when ferns, plants, and trees died and fell into swamps. The swamp conditions prevented the organisms from decaying completely, and after millions of years of intense heat and pressure, coal was formed. Coal is classified into four main types or ranks based on carbon and heat content. Lignite, subbituminous, bituminous, anthracite. The general rule is that the higher the grade of coal, the cleaner it burns and the more versatile its use is. Coal is extracted from the earth through underground mining or surface mining. The choice of mining method is largely determined by the geology of the coal deposit and its distance from the surface. Underground mining currently accounts for a larger share of world coal production than surface mining. Coal can be burned for heating or to produce electricity. To convert thermal coal to electricity, it is first milled to a fine powder, which increases the surface area and allows it to burn more quickly. The hot gases and heat energy produced from combustion converts water into steam to run a turbine and generator. High quality coal is also a useful raw material. For example, it can be converted to coke for steel making. It will be converted to liquid or synthetic gas by advanced chemical processes, making it a possible but costly replacement for natural gas or liquid fuels for transportation. Coal is a highly abundant and cheap energy resource. Coal has powered the industrialization of many nations over history and continues to today. It is a big player in today's energy system, providing 40% of the world's electricity. One major concern with coal is the mining practices used to extract the resource. Ecological impacts and human safety issues, both for workers and neighboring communities, are growing concerns for the industry. Coal is the most CO2-intensive fossil fuel when combusted because it is composed largely of carbon. Coal also contains other elements that cause pollution problems, including sulfur, nitrogen, mercury, and heavy metals. SOx is a leading cause of acid rain, and NOx emissions contribute to smog. In addition, particulates from coal combustion can be harmful to human health. Concerns about climate change from greenhouse gas emissions have put a spotlight on coal plants and have prompted the development of clean coal technologies like carbon capture and storage. That's coal. Oil. Oil, otherwise known as petroleum or crude, is a thick black liquid composed primarily of hydrogen and carbon. The physical properties of oil, such as its thickness, vary greatly depending on the specific combination of hydrocarbon molecules. Oil also contains trace elements of sulfur, nitrogen, and oxygen. Today's oil deposits were formed millions of years ago when dead marine organisms sunk to the bottom of the ocean bed and were buried under deposits of sedimentary rock. After subjection to intense heat and pressure, these organisms underwent a transformation process by which they were converted to oil over millions of years. This is why you may have heard oil referred to as a fossil fuel. Oil is found in underground geological formations called reservoirs. The rocks found in a reservoir have various physical properties that allow them to hold hydrocarbon reserves. Through exploration activities such as seismic, surveying, rock core sampling and other advanced technologies, geologists locate oil reserves. Oil is extracted from the reservoir most commonly by drilling a well. Once recovered, oil is transported by pipeline, ship, rail or truck to a refinery where it undergoes a complex refining process that creates petroleum products like gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, asphalt, asphalt and many more. Currently, the world uses oil primarily to power its transportation system and to create commonly used synthetic products like plastics and petrochemicals. The production and use of oil presents social and environmental challenges. Producing oil causes land disturbance, sometimes in environmentally sensitive areas. Oil-powered transportation systems contribute to global greenhouse gas emission levels and control of oil resources is a persistent factor in geopolitical tensions globally. That's oil. 
Natural gas. Natural gas is primarily methane, or CH4, with smaller quantities of other hydrocarbons. It was formed millions of years ago when dead organisms sunk to the bottom of the ocean and were buried under deposits of sedimentary rock. Subject to intense heat and pressure, these organisms underwent a transformation in which they were converted to gas over millions of years. Natural gas is found in underground rocks called reservoirs. The rocks have tiny spaces called pores that allow them to hold water, natural gas, and sometimes oil. The natural gas is trapped underground by impermeable rock called a cap rock and stays there until it is extracted. Natural gas can be categorized as dry or wet. Dry gas is essentially gas that contains mostly methane. Wet gas, on the other hand, contains compounds such as ethane and butane, in addition to methane. These natural gas liquids, or NGLs for short, can be separated and sold individually for various uses, such as in refrigerants and to produce products, like plastics. Conventional natural gas can be extracted through drilling wells. Unconventional forms of natural gas, like shale gas, tight gas, sour gas, and coal bed methane, have specific extraction techniques. Natural gas can also be found in reservoirs with oil and is sometimes extracted alongside oil. This type of natural gas is called associated gas. In, in the past, associated gas was commonly flared or burned as a waste product, but in most places today it is captured and used. Once extracted, natural gas is sent through small pipelines called gathering lines to processing plants, which separate the various hydrocarbons and fluids from the pure natural gas to produce what is known as pipeline quality dry natural gas before it can be transported. Processing involves four main steps to remove the various impurities. Oil and condensate removal, water removal, separation of natural gas liquids, sulfur and carbon dioxide removal. Gas is then transported through pipelines called feeders to distribution centers or is stored in underground reservoirs for later use. In some cases, gas is liquefied for shipping in large tankers across oceans. This type of gas is called liquefied natural gas or LNG. Natural gas is mostly used for domestic or industrial heating and to generate electricity. It can also be compressed and used to fuel vehicles and as a feedstock for fertilizers, hydrogen fuel cells, and other chemical processes. Natural gas development, especially in the United States, has increased as a result of technological advances in horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. When natural gas is burned, there are fewer greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutants when compared to other fossil fuels. In fact, when used to produce electricity, natural gas emits approximately half the carbon emissions of coal. Despite fewer emissions, natural gas is still a source of CO2. In addition, methane is a potent greenhouse gas itself, having nearly 24 times the impact of CO2. During the extraction and transportation process, natural gas can escape into the atmosphere and contribute to climate change. Natural gas leaks are also dangerous to nearby communities because it is a colorless, odorless, highly toxic, and highly explosive gas. That's natural gas. Geothermal. Geothermal refers to producing energy from the internal heat of the earth. The internal heat of the Earth is generated from radioactive decay of minerals and continual heat loss from the Earth's original formation. Geothermal wells are drilled into the Earth's crust at approximately a depth of 3 to 10 kilometers. The heat is extracted with a variety of methods, but in most cases is drawn from the Earth using water and steam. Hot water from the Earth may be directly extracted to heat homes and buildings. This is done either by directly circulating the hot water through buildings or by pumping it through a heat exchanger that transfers the heat to the building. Geothermal heat can also be used to produce electricity in a geothermal power plant. Electricity is generated when geothermal heat produces steam that turns turbines on a generator. The major regions of geothermal development are in the most volcanically and tectonically active regions of the world. Though geothermal energy is currently a small player in the world's energy mix, one of its key advantages is its reliability and consistent power generation, which means it can provide baseload electricity.
Concerns with geothermal include the accidental release of CO2 and hydrogen sulfide emissions stored in the Earth's groundwater that is often used to carry geothermal in water and steam. Hot water from the Earth may be directly extracted to heat homes and buildings. This is done either by directly circulating the hot water through buildings or by pumping it through a heat exchanger that transfers the heat to the building. Geothermal heat can also be used to produce electricity in a geothermal power plant. Electricity is generated when geothermal heat produces steam that turns turbines on a generator. The major regions of geothermal development are in the most volcanically and tectonically active regions of the world. Though geothermal energy is currently a small player in the world's energy mix, one of its key advantages is its reliability and consistent power generation, which means it can provide baseload electricity. Concerns with geothermal include the accidental release of CO2 and hydrogen sulfide emissions stored in the Earth's groundwater that is often used to carry geothermal heat to the Earth's surface. Additionally, drawing heat from the Earth's crust can, if done irresponsibly, lower the ground temperature below the surface. The upfront costs for geothermal energy production are relatively high. It is expensive to carry out the seismic sensing, test well drilling, confirmation testing, and other necessary preliminary investigations to ensure that your new geothermal plant will be capable of meeting desired production. That's geothermal. Hydropower. Hydropower, or hydroelectricity, refers to the conversion of energy from flowing water into electricity. It is considered a renewable energy source because the water cycle is constantly renewed by the sun. One of the first uses of hydroenergy was for mechanical milling, such as grinding grains. But today, modern hydro plants produce electricity using turbines and generators. The mechanical energy created by moving water spins rotors on a turbine. This turbine is connected to an electromagnetic generator which produces electricity when the turbine spins. There are two main types of hydroelectricity production, dams and run of river. Hydro dams utilize the potential energy from dammed water to produce electricity. A dam is a large barrier constructed to raise the level of water and control its flow. The elevation created by the dam creates gravitational force for turning the turbine when water is released. Some dams also contain an additional reservoir at their base where water is stored to be pumped to the higher reservoir for release when electricity is in demand. This is referred to as pumped storage hydro. The second form of hydroelectricity production is run of river hydro. Run of river still uses turbines and generators, but relies on natural water flow rates of rivers, diverting just a portion of the water through turbines. Because run of river hydro is subject to natural water variability, it is ability, it is more intermittent than dammed hydro. There are various sizes of hydro plants that produce electricity. Large hydro, greater than 30 megawatts, small hydro, 100 kilowatts to 30 megawatts, and micro hydro, less than 100 kilowatts. The Hoover Dam in the United States is a whopping 2,074 megawatts, which is enough to serve 1.3 million people. Of all renewable energy sources, Hydropower holds the largest share of worldwide electricity production. Hydropower has several benefits. It is a cost-competitive form of electricity, even though the initial building cost can be high. It is quite reliable compared to other renewable options and pairs well with other sources as it can be used as baseload power. In some cases, dammed reservoirs can also help with flood control and be a reliable water supply for communities. There are also some concerns with hydropower, especially when it comes to large dams. Damming a river has a major impact on the local environment, changing wildlife habitats, blocking fish passage, and often forcing people in riverside communities to move out of their homes. In addition, dam failures can be catastrophic, claiming the lives of those living downstream. Hydro plants are also not completely free of greenhouse gas emissions. As with most forms of energy, Carbon dioxide emissions happen during construction, particularly due to the large quantities of cement used, and plant matter in the flooded areas makes methane, another methane, another greenhouse gas, as it decays underwater. That's hydropower.